Welcome back to the Wellness Paradox Podcast. I'm so grateful that you can join us on this journey towards greater human flourishing. As always, I'm your host, Michael Stack, an exercise physiologist by training and a health entrepreneur and a health educator by trade. And I'm fascinated by a phenomenon I call the wellness paradox. This paradox, as I view it, is the trust, interaction, and communication gap between fitness professionals and our medical community. This podcast is all about closing off that gap by disseminating the latest, most evidence-based, and most engaging information in the health sciences. And to do that in episode 67, we're joined by Robin Storr. Robin's from the American College of Sport Medicine's Exercises Medicine Initiative. And I'm sure a number of you have heard of this initiative in name started back in 2007 by the ACSM. I'm almost certain that all of you universally agree in the concept that exercise is indeed medicine, but operationalizing that concept in our healthcare system is a much more daunting challenge. And that's what we'll get into in this conversation with Robin. A large part of this discussion will center around the revamp of the ACSM's EIM credential. That is the certificate program that you can take if you're a fitness professional looking to work with these special populations. But we'll also dive into the nuance of the other levers that need to be pulled in order to make this a reality. As an example, we'll talk about academic curricula and unifying those from institution to institution, how certification works, and all the different nuances that go into making this a reality. I certainly think you'll find the information about the EM credential informative and interesting, but more importantly, I think Robin's passion and enthusiasm for this subject and for the work she's doing really comes through, but also highlights the challenges that we face and the need for champions on both the healthcare side and the fitness industry side to really galvanize a grassroots effort to make this a reality. Any information we'd like to share with you from this episode can be found in the show notes page by going to wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode six, seven. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Robin Stewart. Today, we're delighted to be joined by Robin Stewart from uh, ACSM Exercises Medicine. Robin, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. I am super excited to have this conversation. I've certainly, you know, followed exercises medicine for a long period of time. I have my my EIM credential, and now the the credential and the curriculum have been revamped. I learned about the that in greater detail at ACSM National this past year, and that's what we're here to have the conversation around. So I'm excited about this, and we're going to dive in in a second. But before we get into this discussion, why don't you just give our audience a little bit better idea of what your background is? Uh, so I am a clinical exercise physiologist with ACSM, uh, and I practiced actually clinically for like 30 years mm-hmm. um, in various departments in healthcare. Um, started out in cardiac rehabilitation, which is the pathway for many um, clinical exercise physiologists. And uh, oh, I actually started out at the YMCA um, initially. Wow. Yes, I was. Uh, while I was in grad school, I taught swimming and first aid and fitness classes. And, you know, so so I, I started out, and I'm a big fan of the YMCA. I have to mm-hmm. say, I think they they reach a lot of people and mm-hmm. they are very welcoming to diverse populations. Yeah. So I really love that about them. But anyway, and then I went on to work in health promotion, business and occupational health sports medicine. I I started as an exercise physiologist, but I transitioned into being um, a program director at various programs. I spent a little bit of time at the American Council on Exercise. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then the last five years, I've been with ACSM as vice president of exercises medicine, and I believe in this. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thrilled to be able to play a role in advancing the initiative. Yeah, and it's a great initiative, but I did love uh, how you talked about your past and how diverse it was and even starting to YMCA. Funny enough, excuse me, the first workout facility I was ever at was this little tiny YMCA gym in Westland, Michigan. So uh, they were very welcoming to me when I was a a young, overweight high school student. So it's it's a very interesting to hear you come from, you know, kind of similar roots. Yeah. 
So let's talk about exercise as medicine before we even get into you know how the credential has you know been iterated on recently here. Just talk about its its origin and its mission. I think everyone generally speaking understands it by the name, but you know, I'm sure you can provide a little bit more context. Sure. So so it was the initiative was started in 2007 as a joint initiative with the American Medical Association and ACSM. And uh, ACSM took over the management of it. Mm -hmm. um, it was an inspiration by a number of leaders, but it became ACSM leaders. It became the presidential initiative for Dr. Bob Salas, mm -hmm. who's a primary care sports medicine physician. And the year he was president of AC ACSM, he felt that he see, saw so many patients walk through his doors and he was writing prescriptions for all kinds of drugs. And he, at the ACSM annual meetings, he kept learning about the very powerful effects of exercise and physical activity on all these conditions. And he said to himself, like, I should be writing a prescription for exercise. So the, the initiative was started at that point and, and it's evolved over the years. It started in the United States, but a couple of years later, there was international interest. So we now have uh, national centers in 36 countries around the world trying to achieve the same goal that we are. And our vision is, is a very specific one. And that is to achieve the systematic assessment and promotion of exercise and physical activity within clinical care, mm -hmm. and then connecting healthcare with evidence-informed or evidence-based physical activity resources, either within the healthcare system or out in the community. So a lot of dominoes have to yeah. fall in a lot of different areas to make that happen. But um, so EIM has been, has various programs going on uh, to advance some of the fundamental uh, areas that we think are necessary in order to advance it. So for example, we have the exercises medicine on campus program. Yeah. And even though it's not directly related to healthcare, we feel it's a very important place where we can educate future healthcare providers, future exercise professionals, involve our members and their expertise in advancing this idea, not just the understanding that exercise is good for you, which is what that, what that you know, title says, but it's so good for you, it should be something just as significant as blood pressure, high blood pressure, smoking, you know, it, it should be a discussion point and it should be something that's incorporated into healthcare. Um, so, and then we also developed a couple of years ago, you can, I'm gonna, I can keep talking about this. Oh, keep forever. going, so, keep going. So, <laughs> so uh, we have, um, we started a research learning collaborative a couple of years ago with the goal of promoting, connecting people who wanted to do research not specifically on the exercise is good for you side of things, but on the how do you integrate and implement it into a clinical setting and how do you make that clinic to community linkage happen and who's doing research to show what's what works, what is adapt adoptable, what is scalable. Um, and so we've been have we have regular webinars at least quarterly. Um, trying to connect, share people that are doing this type of research, what the challenges have been, what their successes have been, and try to really advance research in that area. And then lastly, I'll just say, we have seven committees that help do the work of exercises medicine, and they have been working hard to develop uh, resources on our website. So if anyone wants to learn more about exercises medicine, go to exercisesmedicine.org. We have resources for healthcare providers, exercise professionals. We have a whole list of EIM related research. Um, and we, uh, we also have information about the EIM credential, which I know you're gonna talk about uh, to help you know, give people tools, our exercise professionals, our students, our doctors, to talk to patients about physical activity and get it integrated into the conversation. Yeah. And so there's a lot of work that is going on, you know, behind the scenes that I don't think people nearly realize uh, how how broad and comprehensive this work is. And I, and I want to go back to some of those dominoes that you talked about, you know, needing to fall to make this a reality before we actually get into the credentials. So you said, you know, assessment, 
and promotion of, you know, physical activity and exercise in clinical settings. Talk a little bit more specifically about that in terms of, you know, what, what is the assessment that you guys are looking to integrate and, you know, how does that promotional piece look in your mind? And then the last thing I'll, I'll add on to that is that promotion also involves connecting with exercise professionals in the community. So, you know, how are you seeing that? Let's go through those dominoes. Okay, I'm happy to. So we use something called the SBIRT model, which is used commonly in healthcare. It was first developed uh, in relationship to dealing with substance abuse issues. And it's approach to dealing with those problems and it's screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment. So that's the, that's the, the plan we recommend. Um, there's a second plan, which is incorporating physical activity interventions into population health models of care. And that that's a separate plan, which I can talk about. But in the clinical setting, the, the assessment piece is doctors and other healthcare providers, they don't have time to do the kind of assessments we as exercise professionals know how to do a cardiovascular evaluation, you know, metabolic testing, body comp, you know, they don't have time nor the expertise to do that. What we want them to do is just assess whether the patient is or is not meeting the national physical activity guidelines, which are basically 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity exercise over the course of a week, and then additionally two days of strength training. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so uh, several years ago, um, scientists and clinicians made the effort to to look at what can we incorporate into the electronic health record that's quick and easy and will help us get an idea of who is and is not meeting those. Uh, and so uh, hence was born the physical activity vital sign. Uh, we, we call it PAVS. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's basically two questions. And that those two questions relate to how often do you exercise per week and how long do you exercise mm -hmm. per week at this moderate, at least at this moderate intensity. And then it's a simple math calculation of the number of total minutes. And so this is something that uh, the patient can fill out themselves or the medical assistant can ask the patient while they're waiting or you know, being roomed or the clinician themselves can ask. And then automatically what our, one of our big efforts is to integrate this into the electronic health records so that when the patient gets roomed, that in addition to measuring blood pressure, and I don't know how often when you go to the doctor, they ask me every dang time whether I smoke. I like, know. Yeah. All the time. And because they have to, because uh -huh. it's because it's a measure that they're judged on whether they ask you or not. So I keep saying no, no, no. But each time they ask me and what that does is it conveys the importance of that habit. Right. And um, so we feel like along with smoking, blood pressure, you know, heart rate, resting heart rate, that, that those two questions should be considered a vital sign. So that's the assessment. Now more could be done. Um, and our pediatric committee right now is looking at questions for pediatric populations. Mm -hmm. And our older adult committee is looking at, well, what's important in an older adult population, more in, in the area of function, right? And independence. But still it has to be simple because we found that clinicians are busy. There's not a lot of space in the electronic health record. So you have to use as few words as possible yeah. to have any shot of having it asked and answered. So that's the first thing. Then promotion, it has to do with brief advice or referral to treatment. Mm -hmm. Now, brief advice could be something as simple as Mr. Jones, I see that your, you know, your blood pressure is high. Did you know that physical activity can really help you bring it down or may help you lower the amount of medication you need? Can I give you more information or can mm -hmm. I send you here? Just something specific to what the patient's concerns are. And even ask the patient, we talk about there's a real movement toward patient-centered care, like giving them ownership of what they're interested in. So, so finding out what they, what they want out of their life, and maybe it's not health, maybe they just want more energy or more time with their spouse and weaving it in, you know, did you know that being more active, every active minute counts. That's a new message out of the physical activity guidelines. It doesn't necessarily, every, everything can count. So 10 minutes here, 10 minutes, five minutes here, you know, just getting people off the couch and moving. It may not get you those fitness results, of course, that a more structured exercise program would, but 
a lot of people haven't listened, been listening to that message. So exercise as medicine is about let's let's help people be active in whatever way they're ready to do it. And then we can move them along the trail. So that brief advice and in conjunction with that brief advice, exercise as medicine has created a whole series of handouts called mm-hmm. prescription for health. And there are handouts for um, for older adults. Uh, parents of young children, teenagers, your average adult, frail older adults. And then we have 36 chronic medical conditions that give basically how to get started. And then the basic based on ACSM guidelines and uh, physical activity guidelines for Americans give specific guidelines and then also tips specific to that disease of what you might want to look out for or what's particularly beneficial. So we, we make those available on our website and they're a help. It's not, you know, you don't want to you know, it's hand it and then done. Yeah. It's supposed to support the message of the clinician or the exercise professional to say, this is important. This is what you do. So then, and some of our physicians that are part of exercise medicine have actually uploaded those into their electronic health records. So it could be automatic. You check it. Okay. Check. This person has osteoarthritis. Check. This person has high lipid levels. So, so then that's what they get when they get their discharge papers or their after visit summary. And then the last is referral to treatment. And that's the trickiest one (laughs) because, (laughs) and if you've talked to to, uh, any of our certification people, you know, there's a lot of work ACSM is doing right now to advance the profession of clinical exercise physiologists and exercise physiologists within healthcare specifically. Mm -hmm. But the problem with referring into the community is that Dr. Um, Number one, um, exercise professionals are currently not qualified healthcare professionals. They're not eligible for reimbursement for their services. Mm -hmm. They are as they're part of a cardiac rehab program because that program is reimbursable. So Mm -hmm. they're not there or um, or uh, 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 peripheral arterial disease that those programs are reimbursable. Mm -hmm. And so clinical exercise physiologists or exercise physiologists can be part of those. And frankly, a very important part of those and a cost effective part of those. Mm -hmm. But if I wanted just to set up shop and say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be a trainer and I'm going to see patients. No, I'm not going to get reimbursed for that. So patients have to be willing to pay out of pocket uh, for your services, or you have to do what we recommended. And that is form a relationship with a practice or a healthcare system. So that involves champions from both sides. It involves a champion from the healthcare system. That might be a physician in a sports medicine practice or a department chair who says, this is important. I want to start this with my group or, but then you need to go to the top, obviously yeah. chief medical officer or chief information officer to try to integrate into the electronic health record. And then you need a champion on the fitness facility side who says, I'm going to, we're here. We want to serve your patients. I'm going to hire qualified trainers. Cause that's a problem. When you refer outside of healthcare, there's an issue of trust and liability. Mm-hmm. And that always comes up. And that's, uh, it's realistic because you can usually work in a gym and you can have a great background or you can have just a weekend workshop. Like there's such, you know, it's not very well regulated um, in spite of all of our efforts, you know, for accredited certifications. And that's a big push that we use. But so you have to have those leaders talk and say, yes, we have those qualified people. We have people with NCCA accredited certifications like ACSM. We have people with the exercises medicine credential that we that will work with your referred patients. So those relationships are and, and putting together um, a mechanism for a referral back and forth is really important. And having a coordinator either based in the healthcare system or within the fitness center to, to facilitate referrals and communication has been found to really be helpful in making those things happen. Um, and we have some, we have probably about 15 community partners that are doing this work. They've tr- made the connections. We're trying to help them. Um, you know, keep those programs going and evaluate the success of those programs so they can share that with others to say, yes, this made a difference. You know, this made a difference in health outcomes. This uh, it's harder to show cost effectiveness. And that's what healthcare systems um, care about. But bigger, bigger health systems can take t- can look at that data and say, yes, these people who are physically active are costing us a lot less. And there is some data out there. I can't wait for it to be published, hopefully this next year. 
Yes, I think I think I heard Francis uh, Narek, who's the director of certification for the ACSM, make reference to some of that data in an event we were at. But I'm so glad you unpacked all of that because it just speaks to the complexity of something that seems like it is so simple. Like, you know, we're the people that are listening to this are fitness professionals and they're sitting here going, of course, exercise is medicine. Doesn't everybody know that? And to a great extent, everybody does. But the things that you talked about are no small feat. Getting something into electronic medical records, you here at Michigan Medicine, I know you know Carrie Denae, uh, who I know very well also, it was a five-year process, I believe, for her to get that in you know, EHR. And so it's not just like you know, Apple sends a new update to your iPhone and, oh, it's in there. Um, there's complexity. And you know, the referral pathway that you talked about, again, in theory, that sounds like, oh, wow, there's great personal trainers all over the place. But you know, there is that trust issue and uh, trust is such a, a heavy loaded word that, you know, I do not want to dive too deeply into that word in and of itself. And there is a lot of work going on to advance the profession towards qualified healthcare providership. Part of that is the education and the knowledge of people in our field. And that's what I want to get into next with the revamp of the you know, EIM credentials. So I guess for starters, Talk about what was the driving force behind kind of iterating the curriculum and then talk about, you know, how it's different now than what it was before. Okay. So we, uh, when I first came on board, um, the exercises medicine credential had been in place for a few years. And so I thought it was important to step back and ask some questions Mm -hmm. like um, what, why was this, you know, why, why was this created in the first place? Um, has it provided value to those who obtain the credential? Why did people get it? Why did people not? Then we did, so we did surveys of our exercise professionals to find the answers to those and some other questions. We also did focus groups at the uh, ACSM summit and uh, ACSM annual meeting. And those focus groups involve both healthcare providers at our annual meeting, doctors and other clinicians, as well as exercise professionals to find out what their needs were. And, um, and we listened to all of that and we said, okay, they're, um, <laughs> for the exercise professional side, they said that they, the, the original, I think, concept for creating the, the exercises medicine credential was this three level network of professionals that doctors would refer to. Yep. And uh, that's a great concept, but the actual implementation of the referral net- network was not possible. Mm -hmm. because uh, you had to get people on a national database. You had to get doctors and healthcare systems to know it was there. It had to be integrated into the electronic health record. That's a big lift that that just never happened. But, but people that got the credential said, you know, it's been really great as a conversation starter with healthcare providers. When I tell them they have it, they're like, what is that? And that opens the conversation to talk about what their background is and their knowledge and skills. Um, The previous um, uh, version of the credential had three levels based on your background, as well as the complexity or the risk level of the patient. But in our focus groups with doctors and other providers, they said, that's too complicated. Like, we can't take the time to figure out who goes where and who knows what. And we just want to know we can send, uh, now this was out into the community, someone to a community fitness facility or an exercise professional in the community. And they can manage some of these patients that we see, not the ones that need clinical monitoring. Those are for clinical exercise physiology in a healthcare setting, but rather patients that we're going to send out into the community. So it was clear to us, we had to simplify it. And and we also asked ACSM staff and they said, everybody was confused. (laughs) So we said, let's simplify, let's, and let's focus on what we, what the most common issues are and what is really needed. In our focus groups with exercise professionals, we asked, what do you need to know? What, what do you, what don't you know that you'd like to know? Mm -hmm. And uh, we came up as a result of that, we came up with nine chronic, nine medical conditions. And several of those are metabolic in nature, hypertension and dyslipidemia, obesity, metabolic syndrome, and NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. 
Then we also heard from our exercise professionals that they frequently saw people with arthritis, osteoarthritis and low back pain. So we added those to the online course. And, um, and they also said, look, we've got a lot of older adults and we need to know how to work with them separate from the diseases, like just in things about working with older adults. So um, we looked at the previous uh, iteration and there were all these exemptions and, you know, some people had to take the course, some people didn't. And we said, you know what? Academic programs at this moment are very different. If someone graduates, um, you know, with an exercise science degree, for example, we just don't know how much preparation they had in working with some of the people with some of these diseases. Um, we don't know how much training they had in behavioral support, you know, health coaching principles and techniques. And, um, and we also, uh, and, and so we said, well, let's, ex and, and then also in, in terms of Healthcare itself, if you're a community based professional, and you haven't worked in a healthcare setting, you don't know some of the key things that might help you be more effective in a conversation with provider key terminology, documentation when you see someone communication pathways, scope of practice, yeah. you know, when to refer when not. Um, as well as uh, privacy issues that are very important in healthcare. So we created a whole, we, we, we got carried away. We got so excited with this. We said, okay, first of all, everyone, we need to have everyone have this information, know that they all have the same foundation of information that is really important. Um, and also, uh, and, and so the original course was five hours in length. This one is 15, but it's so good. I'll tell you more about why it's so good in first place. The, the second thing, um, so, so we, we started off um, with healthcare basics and we move into the chronic diseases. Oh, we have an introduction to cancer, by the way, because exercise or ACSM has a cancer trainer certification that they're updating now. But we had the, the, the uh, professor, Dr. Katie Schmitz, mm -hmm. who is in charge of the Moving Through Cancer Initiative. She mm -hmm. put together a very nice module for us on, um, on working with patients with cancer, uh, which, you know, if you think about, even if you don't get it, this was the other thing, even if you don't get a referral from a doctor, if you look at what's changing, you know, 60% of adults have one chronic medical condition, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and 40% have two. And yeah. then if you look at older adults, you know, over the age of 85, well, then the statistics go up. So chances are, if you have people walking through your doors that are not in their 20s or 30s, they're going to have some health issue that you need to understand how to work with. So we said, this is going to be valuable to everyone. Yeah. And um, so that's why we're doing two things. We're making the online course available to anyone to take for continuing education credits. So you take that course, you get 15 continuing education credits and you get a certificate uh, from the American College of Sports Medicine saying that you completed this course. When it comes to the exercises medicine credential, that's a separate piece. Mm -hmm. And and that had to do with our focus groups with extra, uh, with healthcare providers. And they one of the things they understood clearly was um, education, yeah. right? And so they felt very concerned, uh, regardless of the other training that happened with someone who only had a high school education. Mm -hmm sending their patients to that person, regardless of whether they had a certification or not, they understood education. So we said, look, if we're having exercises, medicine programs, then we need to, we need to make sure that they're meeting certain requirements. And so the EIM credential committee discussed this at length uh, based on all this information we were getting. And we said, okay, one credential, you must have a bachelor's degree in exercise science or a related field. You must have an NCCA accredited fitness certification. So we know you have a foundational fitness certification and you must take the online course. And if you do all of those three, then you can obtain the exercises medicine credential. We have a very cool plaque and certificate that you can get. Um, and, um, that, and then we do, when we have our community partners, that's one requirement for exercise professionals that work in those programs specifically with those programs. Um, so, uh, so, so let me tell, so I'm going to, I'm going to go back and then you can ask me questions about the course. This was so fun and, uh, and big to do, uh, there were th over 30 subject matter experts that I recruited to help make sure that we had all the information that was up to date. 
Um, there, I also had an online design team and a senior course editor and the EM credential committee. And we worked with a graphic designer who knows who used an online platform that was new for exercise or for ACSM so that it's not you're just you know watching a video online it's a very interactive experience so you go through you know you read things something comes in we have a we have coach a coach that pops up we have a doctor that pops up we have stops where we ask you questions to make sure you're learning we even put in movement breaks because every active minute counts and so we want people to stay engaged because it is a long course yeah. um, and then you have to you have to pass each quiz at the end of each module um, with 80 percent correct mm -hmm. um, in order to move forward and then to pass the entire course so i'll stop there for a minute and then let yeah. me ask questions i'd like to take a quick break from today's episode to tell you more about one of our sponsors as all of you are well aware the COVID-19 pandemic has been absolutely devastating for the fitness industry, with upwards of one third of our clubs closing nationally on a permanent basis. One of the few stabilizing forces during this very tumultuous period of time has been URSA, the Global Trade Association for the Health and Fitness Industry. On my crusade to make fitness professionals part of our healthcare continuum, the work that URSA is doing is absolutely vital. They provide advocacy and lobbying support at both the federal and the state level. They support state alliances in many ways, and they also provide resources and best practices to club owners, operators, and individual fitness professionals. Indeed, if we are truly going to become part of the healthcare continuum, we must speak with one unified voice. We must have best practices that we implement, and we must come together as an industry to ensure the public, the medical community, and lawmakers hear our message loud and clear that movement is medicine and it is essential. That is the work that URSA is doing. They've recently revamped their membership structure, allowing large clubs, small clubs, boutiques, and individual professionals to join the organization for an appropriate price that allows them to have access to all of these many great resources and allows us to unify and amplify our voice as an industry. For more information on the amazing work that URSA is doing, go to their website, ursa.org. That's I-H-R-S-A dot org. I-H-R-S-A dot org to look in a little bit further into the work URSA is doing to unify our industry, to move us closer to being a part of that healthcare continuum. Now back to today's episode. Well, no, and it's it's great. And that's to a great extent what I kind of wanted you to explain, what the driving force was behind the change, how it's changed. What I love the most is that you took the time to do the analysis with the critical stakeholders. You talked to the physicians, you talked to the fitness professionals. They said, hey, here's the things that we need to know better to do our job more effectively in this realm. And the physician said to you, which I completely agree with, because I always struggled to explain the difference between the level one, level two, level three. And it sounds like even to some degree, the internal team at ACSM right. didn't know the distinction. So I think the expansiveness of the curriculum. And, you know, I took the credential prior to the revamp and I certainly wanted more in-depth information on some of the conditions that you mentioned. And, and I think you will be the first one to admit this, the user interface and the educational experience left a little bit to be desired there. And, you know, I did see the preview at ACSM National this past year, some of the things that that were showing, and it is a significant upgrade. What I'm, what I'm curious about, I mean, there's a lot of different ways I could take this, and I want to be respectful of your time and our listeners' time. You said something that I think is really important that we need to go back to, and then we can kind of carry it forward from there. You said that there is no uniformity in academic curricula throughout the country. I'm, I'm paraphrasing what you said. And I've had this conversation with many people many times, and, and I agree. Unpack that for a second for our audience to understand what that means and what kind of challenge that presents, because I think it's a really fundamental issue. 
So, um, so if you graduate from a program and you have a bachelor's degree in exercise science or kinesiology or, you know, a related field, mm -hmm. the coursework at those universities can be very different. And someone in within those fields, they may want to focus on sports performance mm -hmm. or, you know, body mechanics, biomechanics, or, you know, working with chronic disease and health promotion or public health, right? Mm -hmm. So somebody could have a degree but, but the curriculum is not standard if you want to become a clinical exercise physiologist. And this is something that ACSM is working on because they are with their baseline certification program for exercise physiologists and clinical exercise physiologists. I know you know this is uh, that, that I, I think it's in 2027. You may know the date better than I do. Is 20, that right? 2027 because it's the class I teach. So I know. Okay, it right okay good. All right. So, so uh, in order to get ACSM's accredited certifications, you must graduate from a university that has an accredited program. And that does what an accredited certification does there's a there's a governing body that comes in and looks at what is taught so there's consistency across universities and the reason we're doing this is because that was the pathway that was created for other professionals to become qualified healthcare professionals registered dietitians did this um, and um, you know that that's sort of the pathway that happens for other professions in healthcare so we're trying to replicate that in order to advance our profession. And it'll take way longer than it should, but I'm, I'm so excited that ACSM is really finally putting some teeth behind this. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so glad you touched on that because I, I think that that can't be stated enough. It's And I've heard, you know, Francis Narek from ACSM say it before. I've said it before in different contexts. You know, could you imagine if every nursing school in the country had different curricula that they had their students go through or med schools or dental schools or physical therapy schools. It would be an untenable situation. That's where we're at right now. And I think that EIM credential, you know, NCCA certification, those are critically important and they definitely help advance the scope of practice and depth of practice in our field. But fundamentally, we do have to solve the academic curricula issue that we have right now. That's, that's the foundation. And let me just clarify something. Um, exercises medicine is a specialty certificate program. So mm -hmm. it's not a foundational mm -hmm. certification. There's a lot of confusion right. over that language. So if you go to ACSM's website, you'll see that we have our accredited personal trainer certification, mm -hmm. our accredited exercise physiologist, accredited clinical exercise physiologist. And then if you go to specialty certificate programs, you'll see we've got an autism, autism specialist. Mm -hmm. We've got cancer trainer. We've got inclusive fitness trainer and exercises medicine belongs in that family. So it's an opportunity for professional development, an opportunity for recognition, for doing additional training to gain some extra knowledge in these areas. So you can be more prepared to work with those populations. So it, it, the world of certification, again, is confusing. But 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 my goal with exercises medicine is to provide some really valuable education for people that are interested in moving in this direction professionally, that they can take with them regardless of of where they go or what they do that will always serve them when they're working in the fitness industry. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point. And it does become a little bit complicated when you talk about degree, certification, specialty certificate. But I guess the analogy is kind of like you go to nursing school, you get your, your BSN. And then from there, you sit for your board exam, which would kind of be analogous to you know, your ACSM EP certification, the NCCA certification. And then maybe you want to specialize in geriatric nursing. So then you go get a specialty certificate or program. And that would be analogous to the EIM credential or some of the other things that you talked about. Yeah, exactly. You hit it right on the head which is the path that everyone else has followed. And it's right. not like the path is unknown for us. We just need to, we need to operationalize it. And to that degree, you know, as we kind of move this conversation towards a close, two sides of the same coin, I want to ask a question on the first side is talk about some successes that you've seen. I know there are many successes around the country. I've been on the webinars for the Research Learning Collaborative, which uh, they're great. And mm -hmm. I mean, Intermountain Health and Kaiser, their health systems are doing some great things. Uh, on one side of the coin, talk about some of the successes. And then on the flip side of the coin, talk about some of the barriers that we're facing right now. 
So, so I'll tell you some of the successes. We just, um, if you get, if you subscribe to the EIM e-newsletter, if you don't, you should. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just go to the EIM website in the top right corner and click. It just comes once a month. So for those of you who are bombarded with stuff, no, just once a month. Um, anyway, we just featured um, Hartford Health, just adopted the physical activity vital signs system-wide. Mm -hmm. They've got a great team there led by an ACSM member um, and one of the faculty that contributed to the EIM online course. And they are working hard on the second part of that piece, the, the referral. But but they it was it took a lot of work within the institution to make that happen. So we're very excited about that. Uh, one of our community partners uh, with George Mason University Freedom Aquatic and Fitness Center, they just received a $20,000 grant to help their program provide scholarships for their 12-week exercise wow. medicine program for underserved individuals in their community. Wow. Um, and they're doing a great job of delivering uh, a 12-week customized program for, for individuals that, you know, that have chronic diseases that need some help. And just to say, the with the last two years of the pandemic, like threw a wrench in the works everywhere and, and fitness facilities as well as healthcare. So a lot of our people are just sort of starting to rev up and come back and 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 really get going. So so we're very proud of that. I'll have to say wherever right right now because we're working on the Physical Activity Alliance is a national group that is about advancing uh, this cause. Mm -hmm. And so there are some there's some work in the background that we're doing related to regulations and policy, right? And that again, that's going to take a while. Uh, so so in the meantime, it takes champions. It yes. takes really wherever this has worked. There's a champion that says, I want to make this happen. I'm going to find, I'm going to look around my institution to find others that I think are committed to physical activity and lifestyle medicine. And I'm going to get my team together and we're going to, we're going to lobby for an effort. And even just to do a pilot program, a lot of these healthcare systems will start first with their employees, yeah. right? Okay, let's offer something to our employees, an incentive program to be physically active. And it can take many forms yeah. um, because Guess who play, pays for the healthcare costs of their employees? Yeah, they, right. It hits them. It hits them in the bottom line. So a lot of times they'll start there first, and if they see good results, then they'll expand. So the barriers are just, um, uh, you know, no regulatory support or reimbursement for it. And so we we do have a guideline that we provide to healthcare providers on how to billing and coding for mm -hmm. introducing physical activity into the clinical visit. But it's tough. You know, we're having to we're having to fight that. Um, and then, and then healthcare providers are really burned out right now and, um, they don't have time. They don't have, they got too many things to do that spend hours dictating into the electronic health record. They don't want anything else to do. So that's a real barrier. And so that's why we try to work with the whole clinical team. It's just not on the doctor or the nurse practitioner's shoulders. Every member of the clinical team can do a little piece to ensure that it's the message of physical activity gets throughout the whole uh, care visit. Yeah, and you said it, all of the regulatory things that are happening behind the scenes, which I, I've been in some conversations around, are, are complex, uh, they are bureaucratic, and it's time consuming. But yeah. there, as you said, the champions and the grassroots efforts that have taken place around the country have been incredibly impressive. So to that end, if I'm a fitness professional and I'm listening to this podcast right now, and I'm inspired by some of the things you're saying, what's the action that you would recommend for that fitness professional to take? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is take that, say, take that EIM online course. We're going to, and if you're, and if you're eligible with your educational background and fitness certification, you know, if you pass the course, then it's easy. It's an easy matter to just fill in the application for the credential. So I would do that first off. Second, where you work, if you work in a fitness facility or an, um, a, a healthcare setting, I would I would start to do a little connecting, you know, with with whoever is the decision maker. We got to get to the decision makers and volunteer your services to help push the initiative forward. One of the ways that we have, and we have a whole an exercise professional action guide that we've put on the website, and we give a variety of ways to try to connect with your local healthcare uh, partners and physicians and explore some of those, get those, that guide, explore some of those ways to try to make yourself valuable um, to the healthcare team or encourage your leaders, if you're not one of them, to start to have those conversations at a higher level, because that's really what gets things going. 
Yeah, absolutely. And we'll, we will link up to all of that information on the show notes page so everybody has access to it. But yeah, that, the first step is becoming educated, becoming informed. And, and I just want to point out to our audience, part of that education is understanding these conditions, the indications, the contraindications. But on some level, an equally important part is understanding how the health systems work and the terminology that they use and just the the administrative challenges that you face. And so I think that's also something that you know, it seems like the course does a good job of getting people acclimated to, because sometimes that could be equally as complex as understanding the medical conditions on some level. <laughs> and then one other thing, I want to give a shout out to Well Coaches. They're an ACSM partner. Yes. And we worked with Dr. Shri uh, Crow, who is an ACSM member and health coach, but we also worked with Well Coaches which is a team of well coaches experts. And there are a number of videos in that module because, you know, you can educate people all you want, but you have to learn how to empower them to take the steps and continue to be active. And that's a skill I know I didn't really learn that. I was just the expert. I know all you do yeah. what I say. And, um, and we're finding that uh, there's a different approach that's more effective. So that's why we incorporated that into the course as well. Awesome. And, and Margaret Moore, great friend of the Wellness Paradox podcast. She was, uh, I think, a guest on episode three or four. So uh, mm -hmm. Well Coaches does some amazing things. And you are right. I learned a lot about how to be an expert early in my career, but not a lot how to be a, a collaborative coach uh, with the people I was working with. So I think that's that's such a good point. Well, Robin, I could keep going on and on and on because I'm so fascinated by this. But again, I, I want to be respectful of your time and our audience's time. So, you know, for us to bring this to a close before I get to the final question, just so we have it on the air so no one has to go to the show notes page if they don't want to. What is the website that people can go to if they want to learn more about exercises medicine? Yep, exercisesmedicine.org. And even if you just type exercises medicine into the search bar, you'll find us. Yes, absolutely. And we will link up to everything, not just the EIM website, but some other resources that you mentioned during this. And this has been a great conversation. I'm excited that we got to unpack what the new credential looks like. And you know, I, I advocate along with you that that is an important first step. Final question before we bring it to a close is the question I always end the podcast on. And I'm very interested to get your perspective on this, given the work that you do. And for me, the wellness paradox is the gap in trust and interaction and communication between fitness professionals and medical professionals. Based upon all your experience in this ecosystem, if you can give fitness professionals one piece of advice to bridge that gap, what would that be? Oh, my gosh. Uh, let's see. Um, make yourself be aware that physicians and clinicians don't have a lot of time. So make yourself valuable. Ask yourself, how can I help them? How can I help their patients? It's not about me. It's how can I make their life easier? And if you approach it that way um, and learn ahead of time what, what their practice is and uh, what kind of patients they see and you feel like there's a match, then point that out. Awesome. Yep. Build, build value. Yeah. Robin Stewart, thank you so much for joining us on The Wellness Paradox. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I just want to thank all the prof exercise professionals out there for doing what you do. Siri, you, I know you know this, but I just want to give you another shout out. You make such a difference in people's lives. You spend more time with people than most doctors do, right? Five, 10 minutes, right? And the time you spend matters. So thank you so much. Well said. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Robin as much as I did. If you found it insightful and informative, please share with your friends and colleagues. Those shares make a huge difference for us. Any information we'd like to share with you from today's episode can be found on the show notes page by going to wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode six, seven. Please be on the lookout for next week's episode when it drops on Wednesday. And don't forget to subscribe through your favorite podcast platform. Until we chat again next week, please be well.